I never take it for granted. Yeah. I never take it for granted that it's going to sell. I never take it for granted it's going to, uh, you know, be enjoyed by a lot of people. When I start writing another book, I might got my go. I can't think about all the folks who are going to read it. Uh, so you're not writing it for them, or you're writing it? I'm writing it for the story. You're writing it for the story. Yeah, and, right. and, and when I start a book, my goal every year, every book, is to write the best book I've ever written. Yeah. And I'm still driven to do that. And Better than the last one, and then the next one will be better than this yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, I can't judge them. Uh, with the hindsight of, you know, 30 years now, I can look it back and say, okay, that was a better effort. That was yeah. a weaker effort. I'm not going to tell you which ones. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I like some more than them. But you, ha you have to love them to finish them. You have to love a book, a story, to even start it. How many times have you not finished a book? Never. So you've loved all your books by your own well, definition? Well, by, by the time I start, uh, I, I start every year on January the 1st. Yep. Uh, the next legal thriller. And I know uh, the entire story from beginning to end. When uh, you sit down, you have the story all storyboarded or mapped out in your head? I, I outlined. Always. Yeah, always. Always. Yeah. Uh, I tell students, uh, one of my cardinal rules for writing popular fiction is, do not write the first scene until you know the last scene. Interesting. Uh, I interviewed John Irving uh, in Toronto a few months ago, and John Irving said he writes the last sentence before he writes the first. Really? I'm not that smart, but I, but I, <laughs> I, I got to know the last scene. Because when right. you write suspense and mystery and thrillers and you know, fast-paced books with lots of characters and lots of balls in the air, lots of subplots and moving parts, you better know where you're going right. when you start or you can really get in trouble. That's, that's, that's fa I had no idea that was your process. I want to come to your process in a second uh, uh, to talk a little bit about more how you work. But I want to compliment you on this book. I'm not, as a fiction reader, interested in the things that everybody else likes. I, I think of myself a little bit too much of a snob. Well, I want to find this thing that nobody else likes. This is not necessarily my kind of book, but I found myself completely unable to put this book down. Or if I did put it down, I'd, my mind would wander a few minutes later and think, I want to read another chapter of that book. Whatever it is that you do in here, you've made it work. It's a really compelling story. I do it all the time. You should read some more of my books. Apparently I should. <laughs> I consume many things. But I will say, the thing about this book that really appealed to me is, it's a pretty simple story, yeah. but it's a story that is so much of the moment. Yeah. It was a little bit like reading nonfiction, or it felt to me like it was nonfiction, because every time I pick up a newspaper or turn on the television, what do I see? Discussions of how there are people in jail who shouldn't be in jail. Or how, some high-profile high exoneration. High-profile exoneration, yeah. forensic science. All of that is in this book. It really felt to me like a very contemporary well, book. Well, first of all, thank you. This yeah. is where I live. I live in the world of uh, legal issues, uh, criminal justice, and especially the problems we have, yep. the injustices we have in a system that could, that could, that's a, it's still a good system. You cannot walk away from this book without believing that the system is broken. It's broken in many ways. It, it, oh, for the most part, it works, but there's so many flaws in it that we could fix if we would just fix them, if we had the will to fix these, these problems. Yeah. We could almost make wrongful convictions uh, non-existent. You're always going to have them. You can't you can do away with all of them. But you, you think that you really believe that we could take the system and make it almost entirely foolproof? Yes. You do? Oh, yeah. What's it going to take? Is it money? Uh, we'd save money. We'd save money, We'd save money yeah. because you wouldn't be incarcerating people who should not be in. You, you wouldn't be wasting time on trials that are not fair. You wouldn't be wasting right. uh, fifty thousand bucks a year incarcerating thousands of people who shouldn't be there. Yep. Y uh, you, you wouldn't. It's the, the, you wouldn't waste tons of money for appeals and lawyers and judges that drag on forever. If you could clean, if you clean up on the front end, if you could give, it, if, you, if you could guarantee a fair trial up front. Yep. You could save so much money on the back end. Right. And it's all about a fair trial. Except theoretically, if the person who's in for the crime didn't do it, somebody did it. So if you're not incarcerating the wrong person, you'd be incarcerating the right person. You'd still be spending some money, right? Yeah, sure. But you you could wipe out wrongful convictions, almost all of them. Not, you can never do all right. of them. If you, but if you if we would just enact a few simple laws, you could really tighten it up and make uh, yeah. wrongful convictions very difficult to. Even do. if you don't save money, you save your soul because you're doing the right thing, which is maybe the, the, the more important the, part. The waste is enormous. The waste of human life. Right. The suffering, the, that's why these stories are so compelling. From, yeah. a, from a storytelling point of view, the, to me, they're irresistible.